I hope this this is clear. Glory, glory. Yes, hello, Professor. We can hear we can hear and see your presentation. To be here today with us. Once again, I am pleased to welcome you to the anniversary congress of the Nikolai State Medical and Pharmacy University dedicated to the celebration of 75 years of activity. Let me to introduce my colleagues, Professor Korlatianu. Uh, he will give a short information about the activity and biography of uh, Professor Lawrence Benz. Alexandro, please. Uh, hello, Professor Benz. Uh, uh, sorry? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, dear friends, uh, um, it's my pleasure to uh, to present to you. Uh,
Sorry, I... I, I didn't... Uh, uh, Would you, would you like me to proceed? Okay, I, 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 I shall begin. Um, so first of all, a, a very big thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful occasion. Uh, 75 years of activity of the Nikolai Tasimatanu State University of Medicine and Pharmacy. I think this is really uh, a, a wonderful day to celebrate. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm only very sorry that I cannot be there in person. Uh, and, and I hope that as travel restrictions ease over the coming year, I will certainly get time to visit you all. Uh, in Moldova. So, so thank you very much indeed. Um, what I'm going to do today is to uh, really give you an overview of how I believe that uh, science and biotechnology can, uh, can contribute towards achieving the sustainable development goals. And what I'm going to do is give you an example uh, of, of, of how this works with the ICGB, because I think we have a quite a broad approach to this, uh, which really allows us to answer uh, and address many of these SDGs. So, as I'm sure most of you know, ICGB is an international organization. Uh, it has over 65 member countries, uh, and it has research institutes located in Trieste, in New Delhi, and in Cape Town, and the headquarters of ICGB are also uh, obviously located also in, in, in Trieste. Now, the mandate of ICGB is to provide a center of excellence for research and training in molecular biology and biotechnology, uh, specifically addressing the needs of our member countries. And of course, uh, this is all really driven by the SDGs, and like, and as I like to think of it, it is science for development. And we have a large number of activities uh, which allows ICGB to fulfill its mandate. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I will highlight certain ones which I think are relevant for today's discussion. And what I like to think is that ICGB approaches this in a 360 degree approach. We, we fulfill many of the SDGs in, in, in reaching this uh, 2030 agenda. And so first of all, I'd just like to briefly touch on the science that we actually do in the laboratories in Trieste, uh, New Delhi and Cape Town, and to emphasize that this science is not done in isolation. It's not the three institutes just working alone. It's done in direct collaboration with our member countries, where scientists come to ICGB, we support uh, exchanges, we collaborate directly with important institutions and universities and organizations in our member countries to ensure that we fulfill our mandate and we perform top class scientific research. And that actually answers one of the cornerstones of the SDGs, and that is building partnerships, collaborations throughout the world based on science and diplomacy. And this next slide just gives you a feel for this level of collaboration. This is just some snapshots I took from recent publications from ICGB. And as you can see, if you look at the author list, we have people coming from all over the world working and collaborating on the different ICGB projects. And uh, currently, ICGB hosts scientists from more than 40 different countries. So really, this is a wonderful network that we have established uh, and, and, and contributes directly towards the SDGs. Obviously, a cornerstone uh, within the sustainable development goals 
is good health and well-being. And ICGB has a very strong program, uh, both in infectious and non-communicable diseases, uh, which work to meet this particular goal. Uh, this just gives you a snapshot of the groups that are working in these areas uh, in across the whole of ICGB. We have very strong programs addressing parasitic diseases, uh, virology, uh, cardiovascular disorders, uh, very strong groups working on molecular genetics, cancer, and neurobiology. And of course, in the time of COVID, uh, we mustn't forget the work that ICGB is doing uh, to address the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And this is uh, just some example of the talks of work that we're doing and Alessandro Marcello will tell you much more about this later. But basically, doing drug screens to try and identify uh, novel inhibitors of the virus, as well as work that is being done also in New Delhi, where ICGB is working to identify therapeutic monoclonal antibodies uh, that can be used to treat SARS-CoV-2 patients. And the workflow here is to identify, is to take serum from uh, convalescent individuals, uh, identify and isolate potentially neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, and ultimately take these antibodies forward as potential therapeutics. And currently, the labs have identified two such antibodies which are moving towards uh, applications in clinical trials. Obviously, with health, we need to feed a healthy population. And so ICGB works directly uh, through its plant biology and biotechnology divisions to develop uh, improved crops, which are more nutritious, have resistance to various forms of biotic and abiotic stress, and also to develop novel biofertilizers, which can help increase food security in communities across the ICGB. And this just shows you some of the groups that are working in this area, in the sector, uh, uh, both on uh, crop improvement and also in the areas related to uh, various forms of stress. Uh, one example I'd like to give in particular relates to some of the work that has been done in Trieste, which has been headed by uh, Vittorio Venturi in the bacteriology group. And what they're interested in is identifying uh, plant beneficial bacteria. Now, as you all know, our, our gut is uh, full of bacteria, and these bacteria are essential for uh, our ability to digest food and, and, and gain optimum nutrients from what we eat. And that's exactly the same with a plant. So in a plant within its root system, which is essentially the gut of the plant, uh, they're colonized by complex uh, by microbiomes, bacterial populations, which play an essential role in the nutrition and, and foster the development of healthy plants. Likewise, in diseased plants, you have a pathobiome, a disease-associated bacterial community. And what ICGB is doing is identifying these plant-beneficial bacteria, which can then be used to develop biofertilizers to increase crop productivity uh, and also do it in an extremely environmentally friendly manner. Um, likewise, we also have uh, activities related to uh, building of capacity in regulatory frameworks for uh, the use, the safe use of modern, uh, uh, modern, uh, modern biotechnological products, which in particular in relation to agriculture. This is not uh, particularly promoting the use of uh, GMO crops, but what it does is it allows our member countries to look at the crops that are now becoming available and to develop their own regulatory practices for regulating, regulating the safe use of those uh, novel biotechnologies. Obviously, a central pillar within the SDGs is the provision of affordable and clean energy. 
And this is ICGB is at the forefront of this types of activities for developing cost-effective and viable biofuel technology. And this is the group uh, that is primarily active in this area. It's the Industrial Biotechnology Division. It's headed by Shams Yazdani in the New Delhi component. Uh, <clears throat> and this program is funded uh, directly by the Indian Department of Biotechnology and they're making great strides in the area of biofuel development. And this is just to show you an example of one such uh, activity that they've uh, recently developed. Uh, it's, the, it's the identification of a highly efficient enzyme cocktail uh, from fungi, which is extremely efficient at generating uh, second generation biofuel, bioethanol. Uh, this activity has now been scaled up and discussions are at a late stage for further upscaling and commercial production uh, of these enzymes, which will really make uh, a major contribution to the um, accessibility of um, cheap and affordable energy and renewable energy. So with this sort of science that is essentially the bedrock of ICGB. Uh, it also offers great opportunities for uh, advanced education, which is supported by a variety of fellowships for both PhD students and postdocs. And this meets perfectly SDG4, quality education. Um, we have a number of calls each year uh, for postdocs, PhDs, uh, which can take up their um, their, their fellowships within the ICGB laboratories. And this just gives you an example of the, the numbers that we're talking about. Uh, well over 200 students and fellows are present within the ICGB laboratories each year. And one of the things I'm really hoping that this presentation today will make awareness within Moldova about these opportunities. And I'd love to be able to see that on this list, uh, to be able to add some names from Moldova uh, for fellows and students to be taking part in these programs. We also have a short-term mobility educational program, these smart fellowships, which will support stays in any other ICGB member country. So for instance, if a student or a postdoc in Moldova has an interesting collaboration with a group in say, for instance, Brazil, and that collaboration could be further extended by an exchange visit, then ICGB is perfectly placed to support those sorts of activities. And this just shows you the sort of movements that we had over the last year or so. Uh, it's a very popular program, and it's something that, again, I would encourage uh, scientists in Moldova to take full advantage of. Well, obviously, in the still on the theme of education, we organize a number of meetings, courses, and workshops each year that really uh, are extremely effective. This shows you the list that we have uh, prepared for 2020. Obviously, in the current pandemic, uh, this has had to be revised somewhat. But again, in future years, I really expect this program to become fully operational again. And I would love also to be able to add Moldova to one of the hosting countries for these types of activities. Now, again, remaining on education, one of the main points of education is to make it freely available. And so what we have on the ICGB website is a huge collection of movies uh, which cover a whole variety of topics, mostly taken from our meetings and courses and seminar program, which include really world-leading scientists giving presentations on a whole variety of different topics. These resources are absolutely perfect for university lecturers to be able to download and give to their students, uh, but it also works very effectively at high school level as well. So again, I encourage you to look at uh, these resources on the ICB website. And of course, education doesn't stop with PhD students and, and postdocs and undergraduates. It goes all the way down to uh, uh, junior school. Uh, and, and, and here we see an example of such 
from the South African National Science Week, which was last year, well, ICGB is demonstrating the false cup. Uh, this is a wonderful educational tool that allows children to be able to really look at cells under this very cheap microscope that can see the nucleus and really at a really very high resolution. And it's something which I think is wonderful, uh, particularly in schools uh, which have uh, really limited access to microscopes and scientific equipment. And then finally, of course, again, coming back to COVID, uh, ICGB has on its website a, a, a complete resource page dedicated to the virus and the, and the pandemic. Uh, it contains tools and procedures for diagnosis, for development of uh, kits and reagents, um, often in, in a way that is uh, avoids uh, reliance upon expensive uh, imported materials and then also we also have a whole variety of other useful information and links on this page which again I encourage you to, to, to look at. Within the SDGs uh, obviously commitment to reducing inequality uh, is central to all of ICGB's activities and goals and in particular reducing inequality and ensuring gender equality in all that we do. And I should just emphasize that we are very active in this regard. Uh, the majority of ICGB senior management are women. And women also make up a very large proportion of our fellows that are on board within ICGB. Well over 50% are women. And many of them are extremely successful. And as you can see from this slide, many of them go on to be award winning women in science and really have extremely successful careers when they leave. The ICGB. Uh, additional gender equality programs at work, including a program that has been developed with the South African Department of Science and Innovation on supporting uh, PhD and women postdocs, uh, specifically uh, from Africa, to be able to take part in ICGB programs. And the Indian Department of Biotechnology is also developing a program to support women scientists to return to a scientific activity after a career break. Obviously, with all meeting all these elements of the SDGs, um, we have to ensure that the products and the fruits of modern molecular biology and biotechnology can actually get to the populations in our various member countries and, that, and, and, and thereby aid their well-being, but also help contribute directly towards the economic development of those countries. And ICGB is very active in this regard through its biotechnology development un unit and the technology transfer department. And what I'm going to briefly show you here is some of the uh, steps that we take to directly transfer technology to industry in our member countries. This just shows you that some of the products that we produce. We focus primarily on biosimilars. So these are products that have gone off patent and are now produced within the ICGB laboratories uh, and which can be transferred directly to companies in our member states. Uh, so for instance, we have insulin, we have human growth hormone, various forms of interferon and so on. And I just want to sh show you this slide because I think this really highlights the value of this sort of technology transfer. So if we focus here at the top, just on interferon to alpha, for instance, um, we produce quite large batch sizes which we can transfer to our members. Um, and the most important figure is this figure here at the end. So the cost of a dose of an ICGB produced uh, interferon, which we transfer to our member countries, uh, is, is this. So it's uh, 15 cents per dose, which is really very little money. This contrasts with what it would cost uh, from the regular suppliers of interferon, uh, and that is 30 euros per dose. So the savings that can be obtained from implementing the production of these biosimilars is absolutely enormous. And obviously this kicks in 
both to the well-being of the population within the country and also helps the economic development. And we can make the same calculation as you can see here with essentially all of our products that, uh, that are available for transfer. We don't just do biologics. Uh, we also do agricultural products. And I mentioned this earlier on when we were talking about the plant microbiomes. But we do this uh, on a regular basis as a collaboration, strains for plants, in a collaboration with our member countries, uh, where we can identify plant beneficial bacterial strains on a specific crop in a specific location, um, which then allows us to identify combinations of bacteria, which can be used as either uh, biofertilizers or potentially as biocontrol agents. Uh, in ICGB New Delhi, uh, they have a world leading program in the production of a whole variety of diagnostics, uh, some of which are shown here. Uh, and these, again, are really uh, available for transfer directly to companies in our member states. So really, I think it's quite clear that by meeting all of these different SDGs, ICGB is directly contributing to meeting SDG 1, the help and assistance to alleviate poverty. And this in turn uh, ensures uh, a, uh, a, a more peace and stability within member countries by bringing all of these elements together and, and ensuring uh, scientific diplomacy and collaboration amongst countries to ensure peace and stability. And so with that, I'll stop. Um, and just to emphasize that uh, really using SDGs, uh, ICGB is driving science for development. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. I'll say thank you very much indeed. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, uh, I'll be delighted to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice Rector. Uh, dear Professor Banks, thank you very much for, for a, an excellent presentation of the ICGB's uh, various and very, very uh, uh, necessary directions of uh, research and uh, technology transfer. And of course, of course, uh, the, um, virtually all the branches of the ICGB are acting in, uh, in the direction of achieving this, uh, say, uh, millennium uh, development goals. But I will uh, uh, take the liberty to refer to a closer period of time and ask you a question uh, about the factors, in your opinion, that make it, made the, it possible for ICGB to so promptly react to this provocation of SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, infection and to these pandemics. Because, uh, well, it, it is difficult to imagine that such a big organization uh, with the long-standing goals, objectives in research can so promptly react to, to uh, a global, pro, uh, a global uh, threat. Um, as you will hear from uh, Alessandro Marcello later, um, we, we, we actually moved very rapidly as an organization. Um, in, in, in February, um, we realized that the, the SARS CoV 2 was going to be a, a global problem. We are fortunate to have scientists who are very flexible and very far-sighted. Um, and so Alessandro and our colleagues in New Delhi uh, initiated activities 
back in February to begin uh, making preparations for uh, the arrival of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in many of our member countries. Um, and, and, you know, that remains the same now. We, we, we have more people, more, more PIs are now active in SARS-CoV-2 uh, related activity. Um, I don't want ICGB to become an organization which simply works on SARS-CoV-2. We have many other responsibilities. Um, but I think it's, it's a very nice demonstration of, of how flexible we are and how quickly we can respond to a global crisis. Thank you so much, Professor. And uh, with your permission, I will microphone or computer. Uh, I will take the liberty to. I just may want to make sure whether whether you can hear me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so my question would sound like this. The recent Nobel Prize was awarded for invention and uh, implementation of CRISPR technology. Uh, so we are kind of eyewitnesses of uh, evolution of biotechnologies, of genetic technologies, starting with uh, knockout. And now we witness the uh, ability or possibility to edit the entire genomes in sense of changing them, um, say, empowering them for, for, for um, say, better properties. So my question is, in your view, how far can we go with the human genome in uh, using this uh, uh, technology? Thank you. I, 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 the technology is it is extremely powerful. Uh, I think in terms of therapeutics, it has huge potential. Um, and it has, you know, I, I really think there are, there are no boundaries to what can be achieved through it. Um, it is equally applicable for human health. It's applicable for uh, plant, uh, plant agricultural studies for development of novel crops, you name it, it it's, it's incredibly widely relevant. And, and, and I'm glad you asked me this question, um, because obviously there's the direct applicability um, and, and the way it can transform uh, healthcare through, and, and nutrition throughout the world. But there's also one other sort of fundamental aspect to it, which really gratified me when I, I saw that the prize had been given for this development, was that the, the people who were working in the development of CRISPR-Cas originally were not doing it to develop genome editing. They were doing it because they wanted to study a very obscure bacterial bacteriophage interaction. And they wanted to understand the basic biology that controlled that interaction. And so the Nobel Prize and all the wonderful avenues that uh, genome editing is opening for us came from doing really fundamental basic research with no practical application in mind whatsoever. And so really what it, what it does for me, it's a plea to support basic science as well, because I think without that sort of support, um, you would never find these sorts of amazing discoveries. It's, it's the blue sky science doing, doing science for the love of knowledge and for the understanding of how biological processes work, which gives the really major breakthroughs. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Banks, for your 
uh, insight in, in, in this, uh, I would say, very, very promising area, but uh, at the same time, very responsible for, for researchers. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor. Next questions, I want to ask my colleagues, please. Uh, Dr. Iliade, please. Ask a question. Uh, first of all, my name is Corina Iliade Tulbury. Um, I'm an um, associate professor at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, dear professor, thank you for your lectures. They absolutely amazing lecture and uh, information. And uh, we've seen a lot of possibilities and opportunities in education at your institute. It's amazing. Being an obstetrician, um, can I go a little bit on practical uh, aspects? Uh, you know, in our country, we have um, a high number and um, high rate of uh, cervical cancer. And we used to, to do a routine screen test uh, every three years. Um, actually, if it's a normal test. And, uh, you know, um, according, I would like to ask, according to your um, huge activity on uh, papilloma human virus, and on your recent activities on uh, SARS-CoV-2. What is your opinion? Do we need to change a little bit the routine screening test for cervical cancer? I mean, during COVID uh, pandemic uh, and uh, during post-COVID pandemic. Or maybe we should need to have um, an early repeat screening test. Or maybe should we rest on this algorithm we have uh, already in our country? Thank you. Okay, so you, you, I know that Moldova has a high rate of cervical cancer. Um, the, 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 the test that you currently employ, is it the HPV test or is it the pap smear? We, we, we used to perform pap test and in uh, some cases, if needed, we perform uh, the determination of uh, human papilloma virus of different types of it. But the screening test, the, the a mandatory one is pap test. Okay. So what, what many, many countries are doing now is introducing the HPV test as the primary test. And if that is negative, then you are in a good position to then say to somebody, that they don't need to be tested again for three years. If you're relying on the PAP test, that's a little bit more problematic because its sensitivity is not as high. Clearly, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say don't you know don't do it. It's it's a very important tool. Um, but normally, what mo what many what many countries are doing now is using the HPV DNA test as the primary screen. And if somebody is positive, at that point, they then go for cytology. And that is proving to be a lot more, uh, a lot more effective. Um, the other issue that you face, and I, you will probably be able to advise me on this, what the situation in Moldova is, um, it's getting women to go for the test. Uh, and that is the biggest problem. Um, you know, so really I would say a combination. Add the DNA test as your primary screen and really publicize going for the test. And if you do that, then I would say, you know, once every three years would be fine. Um, I certainly would not recommend changing the frequency uh, in relation because of COVID. Uh, I think one of the outcomes we're seeing from COVID is really a deterioration in screening for cancers and other diseases because of COVID. So that is something we really shouldn't neglect. There's, there's many other diseases that can be prevented uh, and which are equally important, but they, need, they shouldn't be forgotten about. Thank you very much. I, I hope that... I hope that answered your question. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. Hello to anyone. Um, I would express my uh, uh, admire for Professor Banks uh, because uh, he's sitting in the ICGB, very nice place. I've been there when I was uh, uh, the alumni of uh, Marie Curie Sarah's Fellowship. Uh, so I passed my internship at uh, C uh, CBM uh, company in Area Science Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very interested in the developing bioinformatic expertise in our country. And until now, I collaborate with the university uh, having, uh, having the course of bioinformatics. And as I remember, there was uh, Sandor Pongor, Dr. Sandor Pongor, who was organizing the bioinformatics uh, courses, but I know that he already left. Uh, also, I was looking how uh, ICGV was developing different branches and the expertise in the bioinformatics. So I would like to know from directly from you, uh, what are the next, let's say, two to five years uh, projects related to the bioinformatics development uh, in Italy, but also I know there is a group in New Delhi, and uh, let's say how Moldova can align to them, both in education, but also in research. Okay, so thank you very much for your question, and uh, I, I hope you enjoyed your time in Trieste. I, I, it's, it's a nice city, and so I'm, I'm glad you, I hope you had a good time. Uh, I did. <laughs> so ICDB, as you may have noticed, has actually started to expand its biocomputing activities. Uh, we have recently uh, recruited a, a new group leader to Trieste. Uh, Silvano Piazza, who's, who's going to be, who's running the uh, biocomputing facility uh, within ICGB Trieste. Obviously, within New Delhi, we already have a very large um, computing group that is established there, and they're working mostly on machine learning technologies. Um, the group in Trieste is going to be working mostly on cancer research related activities. But as part of all this, uh, we are going to be dramatically expanding the amount of training opportunities that we can provide to our member countries uh, in, in biocomputing, uh, various forms of biocomputing activity. So there'll be more courses, there'll be more workshops, and we'll also be prepared to go on the road and actually visit countries and, and assist with setting up uh, bioinformatics platforms. I should also add that in in Cape Town, we are also expanding uh, our computing activities, and we have a call open at the moment uh, for a systems biologist uh, to work on plant microbiomes uh, with a view to helping countries in Africa uh, develop their own uh, biofertilizers for specific crops. Uh, so that's that's a, a brief summary of, of, of where we are and where we're going. Okay, then I would like to continue with a question, sorry, just a short one. Uh, bioinformatics always go along with the sample collections of biobanks. Do you suppose to su offer the support also in development of uh, sample collection in different countries yeah. as a, one of the pillar to to determine the sustainability of any kind of research, we 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 are we are very enthusiastic about assisting in the establishment of various biobanks. No 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 question. Thank. You.
the, the, I want to ask Professor uh, Banks and to invite uh, Professor Banks to come in Kishinev, in Moldova, to visit uh, our university in the near future. And I hope that uh, establish a good relationship uh, with ICGB and to have a good result. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Banks. Thank you very much, all the uh, colleagues uh, who attend our, our meeting. Thank you very much and bye. Thank you.